All right. Hello and welcome to the Yet Another Value podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Walker. And with me today, I'm excited to have two repeat guests, my friends, Jeff Moore, Thomas Brazil. How's it going, guys? We were right, trying to, have to answer the other by not, by not saying yes, long. we're doing great at the same time. So. Uh, well, I'm trying, trying to give you the floor. <laughs> Normally, I start this podcast with my guests responding to me asking how it's going, but I'll, I'll pass that. Let me, let me start this podcast the other way I do every podcast. First, disclaimer, nothing on this podcast is investing advice. I'll particularly remind everyone of that because we're going to be talking about a relatively e-liquid micro stock. Uh, it's, a ca- it's a stock that I think all three of us believe is probably a cash shell, but there is a chance we'll discuss it. There's a chance that these preferreds that we're going to talk about are in the money and it's a worthless company. So everybody should remember nothing on here is investing advice. This company in particular, risky micro cap. These two guys are wild men. So everybody needs to do their own due diligence. Uh, second thing I, I start this podcast with is a pitch for you to my guests. The good news is this is a repeat appearance for both of you. So I'll include your first appearances in the show notes. People can go back and listen to those if they want to hear the full pitch. But, you know, I, I just find you two super sharp investors, great eye for picking up quirky microcaps and events. And uh, I'm excited you guys can come on to talk about the new one. So all that at the way, the stock we're going to talk about is Altasource Asset Management. The ticker is AAMC. And Jeff, I guess I'll start turning it over to you now, just broad strokes. Why is AAMC so interesting? And why are you guys coming on the podcast to talk about it? Yeah, so um, basically the, the hypothesis is this thing's a cash shell that's selling for less than we think that the, the cash is going to be worth. There's, and they're, they're, I, I've known about it for probably nine months and uh, there were some really weird preferred stock uh, lawsuits on it that, I mean, who knows how the, 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 the judgment or something could have gone on that, but they've settled two of the three right now. And uh, kind of as you've you've already written up, uh, Andrew, like, you know, there's a lot of incentives to settle uh, the uh, the last one. Um, The first two settled for, I think it was 12 cents on the dollar. So if the if Luxor, which is kind of a fund and wind down mode, and they've got this investment in a weird side pocket that, frankly, I think is a pain in the ass for whoever's having to manage it. They just can't want to keep this thing open forever. Um, I think they're incentivized to settle that uh, probably on similar terms to the others. Um, and uh, if they do that, then you're looking at anywhere from say 32 to $35 a share in, in net cash after you take out the liabilities and stuff. Um, they have been moving investments that they had made in REITs um, around and converting those into cash. Um, I think at the end of the quarter, uh, they had about, I think it was like $29 million worth of REIT investments. And if you look at just a bunch of the read ETFs that are out there, those are generally up by, you know, 10, 12, 13%. So, you know, that may, it, depending on if they still own them or if they've cashed them in, there may be some more cash from that. Um, but uh, yeah, so I mean, you know, one of the 40, there, there's a shareholder that owns about 40%, uh, Bill Irby, William Irby. And, um, you know, he's got interests in a couple of crypto exchanges and they've done, previously this company had been involved in some real estate things. And so they have openly come out and said, hey, we are actively exploring um, uh, purchasing a fix and flip lending business or a crypto business. And, uh, you know, so right now, especially where where Thomas and I were buying, you know, we're buying for, you know, less than two thirds of what we think net cash could probably be um, or should realistically be. And uh, then you get, so there's your, kind of your margin of safety is that cash and then a clean balance sheet at that point. And then you get this kind of, free call option for a fix and flip lending business that I would compare to potentially sake of capital, which um, is a little, eh, it's not a little anymore. They've done a lot of uh, debt offerings and stuff, but it's, it's a pretty good size fix and flip lending business that I really like. I know that a lot of people hate them, but I've got a background in real estate. I tend to think that those companies are probably a bit better than um, uh, m- most outside investors. And uh, then if they go into a crypto business, specifically like the forum, which is an interesting crypto exchange, um, you know, we can debate the merits of crypto all you want. I, I kind of think crypto might be bullshit and, you know, Thomas is into it. That's cool. I, I respect that. Well, I mean, it's fake money. I mean, I can't imagine the powers that be fake in the lizard money. people out there. Oh my God. Want to <laughs> but um, I mean, if, if they buy a crypto business in exchange, I think that's a real business. Um, you know, and uh, ultimately the thing could rocket ship because of that. And it certainly has a ticker for that. Uh, rel- it's low float. So everybody, this is a quintessential micro crap. I think that's a, a, a 
a phrase that Andrew coined. Uh, I, I accidentally coined that Andrew. on my podcast, yeah. with Thomas. But hey, yeah. let, let me let me pause you there, and then I'm going to get Tom's thoughts on it. But I, I just want a high sure. level for everybody who's listening because we went through it really quickly. The thesis here is AAMC has 90 million in cash plus equity on their balance sheet. If you just looked on their balance sheet, they've got 150 million in preferreds left outstanding. So you'd say 90 minus 150 is negative 60. Uh, that's bad, right? But uh, Jeff, as you were saying, they've already settled some of these preferreds for about 12 cents on the dollar. So yeah. the real math here might be 90 minus 150 times 12, 12%, which would get you to about 70 million of net cash and equity. That would be well over thirty dollars per share versus today's share price is under thirty. So that is that the high level that you're you're talking about just for asset value? Yeah, basically. I mean, I, I've not pulled out my calculator for for this conversation and actually calculated that out. I haven't done that in a few days, but yeah, I mean that that's the rough math. Yeah, and they have settled, like I said, two of them. And and basically, when you're looking at this, the, I mean, you should be reading all of the documents, right? But you can basically get the thesis from just reading the last 10Q and the last two 8Ks. I mean, there's probably 35 pages of documents you need to read and half of that doesn't even matter. Um, you, yeah. you, tweet, you tweeted this, I don't know, Monday, last Friday, something like that. I think last Friday. And within six hours, I had read the two 8Ks and the 10Q you were talking about. I was like, oh, oh yeah, I get it. This is, this is pretty simple. I, as I said in my, in my write-up, I was like, you could just read Jeff's tweet and that's basically the, the thesis. But Thomas, do you want to add anything? I know there are specific things on this that on this I want to turn to you, but do you want to add anything to the, the stuff Jeff and I have talked about so far? No, nothing. Nothing so far. <laughs> so, no, so Jeff actually did a great job. I'll let me add two things. One, yes, please. Or two things. One, there's a there's a very large lawsuit, which uh, you know, we can debate the merits of the almost, I mean, I think it I think it is actually a billion. It's been a minute since I've checked on it, but a billion dollar lawsuit against the uh mortgage or mortgage originators that they were the mortgage that they were servicing. Uh and also, you know, this is kind of like one of the last remaining. Or public investments that Bill Irby has to potentially, you know, be a phoenix, um, and I think those are particularly attractive. So, you know, willing to wheel and deal, cash shell, you know. Let's, and I think that the I would also add that if you really read the documents on the preferreds, they're incredibly toothless. You know, so, I, there are two things that I, I really want to get your your thoughts on. So, the preferreds we did we did mention that they've settled with I think it was Wellington and Putnam. They settled for about twelve cents on the dollar. Luxor is mm -hmm. the last person outstanding, but Luxor is leading a lawsuit against the company. Luxor owns a lot more of the preferreds than uh, Wellington and Putnam. And Luxor, I, I think you guys said this is side pocketed or part of a winding down fund or something. So Luxor might also be looking at this and saying, well, you know, like Wellington and Putnam have business to manage. This is our last thing. Let's fight till the end and try and, you know, maximize value because we're the last kind mm -hmm. of person from this becoming a cash shell. So I guess, Thomas, I'll start with you. You, the preferreds, why do you feel so good that Luxor is going to have to settle around 12 cents on the dollar? I don't, I don't, I don't think right? they have to. Let, let's take the other argument. Let's say okay. they don't. So they have to be paid in 2044. It's a long time from now. Yep. A long time. So even if you were to assume, like, I don't even know, like 8% on the cash, do you get to the, to the payment in 2044? I, I don't know. I mean, they're, I think they're, I, I believe their pick, or I think their bullet maturity, uh, even in the market, if they try to sell them and wind down their fund, they're probably only worth 20 cents on the dollar, maybe 30 cents on the dollar. So I'm not saying it's perfect, uh, but, you know, lawsuit plus cash plus, you know, the directors have the obligation to, well, I just say that the DGCL is not really St. Croix law, but on the DGCL, you'd have, every right and opportunity to maximize shareholder value under the business judgment rule. And, you know, maybe that means dividing the money out now. Maybe that means doing a deal. You know, there was a very famous European activist who was sitting on a piece of debt that was due in 10 years. And he said, look, I can go to Monaco and put it on red or black or we can renegotiate this debt piece. What do you want to do? So you have a lot of options. And I think someone on Twitter said it's like playing chicken with, with the preferred. Okay, it is. The difference is that chicken isn't up until 2044 and we get to make all the moves. We get to move all the chess pieces between now and 2044. I'll shut I up guess, now. I guess, no, I guess the one thing I worried about, because you guys know I, I'm here with you, like when two funds settle at 12 cents on the dollar and there's one fund outstanding, 
you've got to think precedent says 12 cents on the dollar. But I do worry Luxor looks at this and says, hey, you know, 12 cents Nothing on the dollar for us, 150 yeah. million, 12 cents on the dollar is just under $20 million, right? Well, mm -hmm. we've got a lawsuit outstanding because part of the preps, people can go read the documents themselves, part of the preps, they were supposed to be puttable back to the company every five years or something. And the company, the reason these have become toothless is the company said, we don't have the funds, we're not going to do it. And a court, I think, pretty much upheld that, but Luxor are suing to say that they don't have to. Uh, but Luxor could be looking at it and say, well, you settled with everyone else, but now for us, like, you guys are going to burn $2 million in this lawsuit defense if we keep this lawsuit up. So maybe Luxor is looking at that and saying, $2 million against $20 million settlement, these guys are going to have to tick it up, 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 up. And you know, every $1 million that goes to the press is a lot of money that's coming away from the comments. So how would you look at that kind of game theory or chicken on Luxor's side? I mean, Chuck Soar, Chuck Soar. I call it Chuck Soar. <laughs> uh, Chuck Soar is basically a liquidating hedge fund. This is a side pocket investment, it's the last remaining investment. I mean, Luxor itself had its own regulatory issues. That's why it liquidated. I don't want to like like throw too many stones, but like this is not exactly people that have the cleanest hands. I don't know if they had some if they had some relationship with Irby and that's why they did this deal. I doubt it. I think they were probably just not doing any work and they weren't doing two D. Um, and it was a different time, you know. Bill Irby wasn't it's quite uh, in I would say now he's at redemption mode. There was a time when he was untouchable pariah pariah mode uh, so this is pre pre redemption pre pariah uh bill irby and you know bill irby was like on the cover of like i don't even know like fortune magazine and shit like that like people were talking about bill irby like he was like god's gift to the well, mortgage industry th that was my next question so either jeff or thomas whoever wants to talk about do you, can we just quickly go into bill irby's background because as you said he he is like you know on the heels of the financial he was, crisis yeah. he was a rising star and then everything fell apart. I mean, this man has rode rocket ships up to the moon and down to the ground. So can either of you give me a little bit more background on Bill Irby? I mean, I can do it. Jeff, can you do it? Do you know enough of his background? Honestly, no. <laughs> okay, I'll give some, but this is only from like as an outsider. You know, I had people calling me about Bill Irby, talking to me about the spinoffs that he was doing. There was like ATLS and there was like, what is the other one? There was ATLS, there was... AAMC, there was there was like a million spinoffs. I've never seen so many damn spinoffs. It, it was all coming out of Aquin, if I remember correctly. Is that right? Yeah, and everybody was like, oh, this guy's a genius, all these spinoffs. Everybody was kind of likening it to like Howard Jonas, I feel like. It was like, it was like uh, what is Howard Jonas's original entity? IDT? I, IDT is the original Howard Jonas. Yeah. And that, yeah, there, there's been some crazy stories with that one as well. Yeah, and like they were like, oh, this is like this one's gonna be like straight path, and this one's gonna be like this. And so I was like, oh, well, this is getting exciting. And um, I think when it was either AMC or a ATLS, one one of the ones that was doing this software, I can't remember. It spun off in twenty, and it went to like two thousand. I mean, it was like the greatest spinoff of all time, and now it's at like zero or something. It's not at zero, but so and you know, if everyone thought. Someone was giving me a little vignette of, of uh, Irby recently, and they said, you know, everyone thought this guy was all about technology, but really, like, he was just like a, you know, hacksaw, man. Like, he would come in and just, like, cut costs like crazy and tell you, like, I know how much it costs to run this operation, and half of you guys are needed and half of you aren't, so why don't you guys just decide as a group who's needed and who's not, or I'll make the choices myself. And, and that's how he would run the show. So he was very conscious of costs, and it makes sense because, you know, there aren't that many efficiencies in the world. And this guy was, you know, acquiring businesses. So it's not like he was like, you know, coming up with new products or something. And uh, it makes sense. And so that's what I know of Bill Irby. And then, you know, I remember he was on the cover of like all kind of magazines and well-regarded in the mortgage industry. Um, and then he famously sort of moved to the Virgin Islands. Everybody thought he was a genius because he was going to say all his taxes and he was doing it for his shareholders and rah, 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 wasn't this great. He was so shareholder friendly that he was going to move himself across the world to save money for taxes. And, uh, you know, I'll stop there. I don't even know what happened. Like, I know, I know some of the indictment stuff or not yeah. indictment, I shouldn't say that, but the legal issues. The, the only thing I could add there is, I think that was all right. You know, I, a lot of the fortune was built on the heels of the financial crisis, mortgage servicing rights and all that. And there was right. lots of, there were lots of lawsuits, investigation. I don't know, but eventually there was a settlement with the, uh, NYDFS or whatever that that was basically hey you know yes they were the low cost mortgage provider but it's because they didn't invest into anything right like their systems were so bad and there was there were right. lots of bad allegations and I believe and this is going to be important so anyway with Irby I think that my thesis 
the piece I like is this man, yes, he went way up, he went way down, but now you're buying a cash shell and he has shown the ability before to capture the, the kind of stock markets, as you called it, the sizzle versus the stake. So if you could do something that gets a lot of sizzle here and you're buying below cash, well, you know, that, that, that could be really great. Uh, one of the key questions I had, so I think as part of the settlement with uh, the N New York Financial Services or whatever, I think he's precluded from joining a board or serving as an executive member as a public company. And he owns almost 50% of the stock, but he's not on the board. He doesn't have any uh, any management positions here. So am I thinking about that right? And if that's right, how involved is he actually going to be in how AAMC deploys this cash? I mean, I think they still need his vote because he's such a large shareholder to be able yeah. to get anything done that needs to requires a shareholder resolution. But that's correct. I mean, my understanding is he's not allowed to serve on board or have any executive capacity at the public company or something like that. Yeah. Um, Jeff, Jeff, do you have anything there or anything? No, I mean, you can't you can't ignore a large shareholder like that. Yeah, and, and the facts they're the fact that the two of the businesses they talked about targeting were fix and flip real estate, which remember Irby made his kind of fortune with mortgage servicing rights and crypto, which Irby has done some podcasts where he says, hey, Jeff, you mentioned the crypto investments he has. He's a crypto bull. I think that is all you need to know that he's he's kind of got his thumbs on the scale of where this, this cash is going to be directed. Uh, let's see. Let, let's turn to the, where the cash is going to be directed. So I think what you, got, you guys, me, were bullish on is if they make the right acquisition here, small float, things could get pretty crazy. We can talk about precedents here, but there's two routes it seems they'll go, either fix and flip or crypto or maybe mortgage servicing. But you know, I think the one we'd all be super excited for is crypto. So either, Thomas, I know you're the crypto bull. People were emailing me today saying, hey, Thomas did a podcast saying he's got an $80 basis in Bitcoin. Bitcoin's a lot more than $80. But you know, either of you can start, if they did crypto, what do you think the targets are? What do you think the deal would look like? All that type of stuff. I mean, I, since he's a financial services guy, I think he's going to lean more towards uh, crypto financial services, meaning like exchanges, maybe wallet providers, something that's got it like fixed in, like not fixed income, but it's got like actual cash flow. I think he's going to be less inclined to do deals where, you know, in VC land where great product, very interesting potential business model, but how do we monetize it? I, I feel like he'll probably stay away from that kind of stuff um that would that would be my two cents on that i mean i i know a lot of the i see a lot of the deal flow in the sort of crypto space um so i can imagine the stuff he's being shown some stuff might have a crypto flavor but not be crypto so for instance like recently i was talking with a company that is really a cfd provider but they have a crypto element and they they uh I think this CFD is You like, said CFD. Can you can you uh, break up that yeah, acronym? Con, I think I think they're just contract different providers. It's not really relevant in the states, but in the UK, it's quite relevant. Um, uh, and I have a thought here, and then and then Jeff, I want to hear on the fix and flip stuff because I'm I'm not opposed to those businesses. I mean, those are great businesses too. Uh, but on just to finish on crypto, uh, CFD contract is different. It's it's really a European thing. Um, these are companies that allow people to basically kind of like a Robin Hood, you know, they allow people to basically punt around with their capital um, and people think, oh, these good businesses. It's like, okay, maybe socially we can talk about whether these are great businesses, but economically, these are pretty decent businesses, allowing people to basically gamble in financial markets, uh, you know, pinging on a few, I guess, you know, the seven deadly sins is not a bad thing. Um, and uh, they have pretty low valuations compared to the crypto peers. So a lot of them are reluctant to go public, give you a SPAC or things like that. And so I can imagine, I can see a transaction where there's some CFD provider, you know, it's, it's, it's the St. Croix, right? That they're incorporated. Yeah, I think that's right. Even, even if it was listed in the States, it wouldn't be a problem because you would have a sub that's, that's foreign. But uh, so you could buy something at like a decent multiple and then you could basically post like, oh, look at SoFi, look what SoFi trades for, you know, like look at what. Look at what this crypto company, look at Robinhood trades, you know, and so you could do that kind of like uh, SPAC math. I'll call it SPAC math because it's not real math. It's SPAC math. I, uh, I, we were talking before, you know, I agree with you there. Uh, here's, so, here's the other thing go before you go. Because of some of the people that are on the board, I think it's possible that things that wouldn't necessarily fly for a Delaware corporation might work for this St. Croix corporation because of some very influential people that are on the board. But I'll finish there. Could, could you give me an example of something that wouldn't fly for a normal Delaware corporation that you think kind of might be doable here? Just companies that are worried about regulatory oversight from like a Delaware court 
or New okay. York court, like especially like a New York court. So a New York corporation, you got FinCEN and things like that that are can be incredibly restrictive. I mean, the SEC filed a lawsuit against Ripple. It was like yep. one of the top 10 projects in crypto and they filed a lawsuit saying it's a security. And yet the SEC has come out and said that crypto is not a security. And it's like, well, okay, which one is it? Now, when you read the lawsuit, it's pretty damning. I mean, the, the what went on in terms of the, the sales. So I won't, I won't unpack that, but let's just say that there's a lot of regulatory uncertainty where someone think like, hmm, wouldn't it be nice to have a little bit of cover with a, you know, the governor of St. Croix changing the law so that I know that I have some, what's the phrase people use? Like, uh, I don't know, some, it, some uh, it's safe just, harbors. Get a U.S. cost, get a U.S. equity cost of capital, but without the right. U.S. regulatory risk. That makes sense. Exactly. And, Thomas, last thing on crypto. So it doesn't seem to me like you think, I, who knows, right? We're, we're third parties speculating, but it doesn't seem like you think like a miner is the play here or something. It, you think it's more of a, a real business. You could no, well, miners have real cash flow. So I mean, because you can basically hedge out the, you can basically hedge out the Bitcoin. You can go in the futures market. I'm not opposed to a miner. Uh, I don't think you'd have that same benefit of like U.S. regulatory oversight. That's not really normally a problem. Um, but yeah, I'm not opposed to a miner. I'm miner exchanges. Uh, anything that produces cash flow that's not necessarily something too, too strange. Um, yeah. Let me flip it over to Jeff. Jeff, I want to do yeah. flip it over. Jeff, I want to talk fix and flip in a second, but I just want to stay on the, the crypto thing. When you were kind of doing the overview, you mentioned Irby had a position in a crypto company currently. Can you can you dive into that a little bit? Yeah, it's uh, the forum. Uh, he was like an angel investor in it. Um, you can just Google uh, William Irby crypto exchange and it'll pop up an article on that where he was talking about it. And basically what they do is, well, I mean, really it's, 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 it's kind of like what's happening in Central America, right? Is that it, it, it enables businesses to take crypto payments um, from their customers, right? Which I find that to be pretty fascinating. Um, so kind of like square for crypto? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, and there, there can be a real future there. I mean, it doesn't even, that's the thing. Like it doesn't even have to get a huge market share really. I mean, it, you know, they could, you know, the, 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 the local ghetto mark down the, down the street from my house, you know, them to being able to take crypto. I think that'd be fascinating, you know, and if they get, you know, a couple thousand of those, you could get some really interesting stuff happening and, you know, then you get economies of scale and all that other stuff. I, I, I just think it's fascinating. And there's, and there's really not a whole lot of risk for them, right? Cause I mean, they can hedge things out. I mean, it's just an exchange. So, um, and then there are tetrary things I'm sure they can get into, but um, there's some interesting articles on it. Management of it seems pretty good. And it just seems, you know, really, if you've got an investment tied up in that, like, why wouldn't you want to get that into a public entity, you know? Especially so, one that you control. Right. Uh, you know, I think one of the things as value investors, right? And one of the issues I've always had with SPACs is, hey, here's a SPAC with $10 per share. They're going to go buy something, right? And they're going to take $200 million in trust. They're going to buy something for $200 million. And then if you're betting on going up, you're basically saying, hey, whoever sold this sold way too low, right? Like we're basically betting on a seller selling way too low. So I think one of the first pushbacks would be, let's say they do go buy a crypto company, right? A crypto company is going to say, Bill Irby, you've got $70 million on AAMC's balance sheet. We'll take your 70 million. We'll go public through you, whatever the structure looks like, right? And then people are going to say, well, you know, why did they sell too cheaply? Is the market going to be excited about this? And the reason I like this is you're buying below cash. And I think there are several recent precedents that say, yes, the market might get really excited about a crypto deal. So it, Jeff, I'll, I'll turn to you, but Thomas, you feel free. Can you give me some of the precedents or one precedent for something that the market's gotten really excited about that's done a crypto deal? Well, support.com. And, and I want to say I was brilliant because I found this before anyone, right? I was buying it in April and March of last year for like a dollar a share is trading for, you know, two thirds of net cash. And I thought I was just a fucking genius because I, you know, I got a 30% return on it or something when it traded up to net cash. And then, you know, don't think about it. It comes across my, my feedly that they're doing a crypto deal. And I'm like, Oh, well, this is kind of dumb, you know, whatever. And I'm glad I'm out of it now. And then it turns out Thomas was, was buying into it after the crypto deal and stuff and did okay with it. And then I, I think, I don't know, what'd you sell it at Thomas? You know, I didn't play it well at all. I bought it at two fifty, and I sold it at like three dollars. So I did not play it well at all. It's a long story. I was doing other stuff with some people, and yeah. you guys might know I was working on other stuff. But in all, I'm super, I'm super long Bitcoin, so like, I'm super long crypto. So I was, I was trying to be prudent and be like, I don't, even though I love the sizzle, I don't need more crypto exposure. So it was, it was more, I was trying to be prudent. 
just to give everyone guess. some background, support.com, as Jeff said, this was a well-known cash shell among all value investors for years and years and years. And they had this crappy support business, support.com. There was some weird litigation. I can't remember it. I think they were doing care for one of like Circuit City or something. I can't remember, but it, it, Comcast as well. But it traded below cash. We were like, this is a crappy business. In March, they announced the deal to, to buy a crypto miner with all that cash. It went from 250 to three. And then the deal went through a couple of weeks ago and the stock's gone from, you know, for a while, as I like to say, it still started with a three. There was just an extra digit behind it, right? So it was yeah. a 10X. And no, no, okay. they announced a deal. It went from it went from two dollars to eight dollars, and it went from eight dollars, and it trickled down to like three to two, three bucks. And now and it's gone then, up. Yeah. And then it went once the deal kind of closed, and they got options on it and everything. It went Wall Street. That's parabolic. But that's one of the things I like about AMC. Right? They announced a crypto deal. You're buying below cash. You've got the shot that it, it turns into support.com. So I, I like it. It's like a value investor's way to play speculation. But Je Jeff, anything else on that? I love the ticker symbol. Uh, it, it, people actually confuse it with AMC um, yeah. on, on some of their threads, which I mean, I don't guess that's a good thing or not. I, I kind of chuckle every time I see that, though. Um, hey, it's happened in the stock market several times recently, right? For a yeah. day or two, people get the, you know, they think TLSA is Tesla and it, TLSA goes up 100% for a day or two. So you've got that's a weird that's a weird call option to be buying as value investor, but it's possible. What about but Jeff? Go ahead can and I, can I, since yeah. you said that one point, I think it's important, which is like so much of what we're trying to do is like find risk averse ways to make you know high returns on invested capital. And part of that is, you know, you know, the, like you just said, like there's there's steak, which is just like there's there's like meat and there's some there's some meat on that bone. And then there's just like, okay, yeah, they could do a pretty this guy like really wants to do a deal. And and he has a lot of capital and he's not gonna do anything stupid, I don't know, hopefully. But uh, but but it's just even like Green First, like you think Mike Mitchell was trying to like shoot the lights out and go for a 10X? Like, no, they did a good deal. And then he assessed the deal and he was like, hmm, that's actually a pretty good deal. He bought it as a cash shell, did a good deal. And then he was like, hmm, that's really interesting. And they're like, we're working on something else. And they announced another deal. And he's like, holy crowley, you just made me very wealthy. So there's something, there's something to be said for like, you know, I, I think it's like Dohando, you know, it's like, it's back, it's back to what's his name. I can't even think of his name now, but you know, Dohando bets, you know, you're sort of like oh, Manish high Pink uncertainty, dry, low yep. risk. Yep. Yeah. It's like high, high uncertainty, low risk. To me, this is like very high uncertainty and very low risk. It just is. Uh, that doesn't mean like this is a small stock. So everyone should do their own work and also like, you know, buy over time because he doesn't have to do a deal tomorrow. That's the other thing. The stocks run a little bit recently. He doesn't do a deal tomorrow. He has years to do a deal. Um, but that's what I like. I like high uncertainty, low risk. Right. Well, you know, we we focus on crypto because I think crypto is the thing that could bring the most sizzle and sexiness to this. But uh, there, Irby's got a history with financial services. They specifically called out fix and flip as a as, as a place they might invest. So, Jeff, I know you've got experience in the space. Could you tell me oh, what is a fix and flip company, and why why do you think it would be kind of attractive if they if they took that public instead, or if that's where the deal ultimately landed? Yeah, so um, fix and flip is you got an investor and uh, a real estate investor, right? And they find a, a junk piece of property that, you know, may, you know maybe they want to do a really quick closing on, um, but they need a lot of cash for it. And, you know, maybe they don't have time to, to go to a bank for it. So they go and say, hey, I need $500,000 to buy this house. It's probably worth six fifty dollars right now. Um, and then they go to the lender, say, hey, you know, I, I need to do this deal. And they go, okay, we'll, we'll do, you know, we'll do this because we think we got a margin of safety on it. They give them funding for it. Sometimes they give them fix up money. Uh, these are generally pretty short term loans that are, are high interest. Um, and, you know, a lot of times there's a lack of due diligence on the property too. Cause I mean, you know, sometimes the uh, uh, not credit worthy people borrowing, but a lot of times, you know, you have credit worthy people doing the borrowing. It's just, they need to close like now to make the deal done. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many real estate deals I've done where like my offer was, I, I've offered less money. It's just, I was able to close the deal like that instead of having to wait a month and a half for a bank to go through underwriting and, you know, cross all their check boxes and stuff. So I, I yeah. can dream, but you know, as somebody who doesn't do a lot of real estate, it does strike me as I, I get, you know, you can have four sellers in the stock market where there's a margin call or something, but yeah. what's the reason that a, a seller in real estate where generally there aren't margin calls, you know, the, the loans are pretty long. What's a reason a seller would need to sell today versus a month, a month from now for a higher price or something? 
Okay. Well, I mean, there, there's some psychological study. I, I can't remember what they were doing where it's like, hey, I'll give you $50 uh, today or I'll give you $51 tomorrow. Which one would you rather have? Everyone always says $50 today. Now, if you say, hey, a year from now, I'll give you $50. And then a year and a day from now, I'll give you 51. People then are willing to wait that extra day because they've already waited for a year. And I, I think that that's kind of similar because a lot of times, you know, you have people who have inherited property or maybe code enforcement is after them over stuff and they're accruing fines by the day or they're behind on the mortgage. A lot of times there's just a psychological thing where it's like, I've got to get rid of this right now. Um, I need cash to, you know, go move or, or, you know, just, you know, settle an estate or something like that. So, you know, and, 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 you know, with the offers we put in, if it's all cash versus something that's contingent financing, it's like, okay, there's an unknown to that. So it may not be that like I'm closing two weeks quicker than the other person. It's also that other unknown of, well, yeah, he's closing two weeks sooner. I need my money a little bit more, but there is some risk that maybe the appraisal doesn't come through on this property for the other buyer that's offering me money, right? Because like whenever I'm buying stuff, it's like, man, I just did my walkthrough. I'm not even doing an inspection. You yeah. know, as long as this house is still standing the day and in roughly the same condition um, on, on the day of closing, I'm going to show up and I'm going to buy it. And the, by the way, the only other thing I need is a clear title. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that that's kind of the incentive set up for a lot of these things. Um, yeah. Just, so fix and flip, you know, it strikes me as a business, it strikes me as a pretty good business, probably higher risk, but pretty high returns if you know what you're doing. But one, yeah. one of the things, this, this company, net of the preferreds we've talked about, assuming the preferreds take the haircut, $70 million in cash. Are there fix and flip businesses worth $70 million? Because it strikes me as more business where I'd be like, hey, Jeff really knows what he's doing with real estate. Him and I go into business together. I give him a bunch of cash, but you know, it's Jeff is really the intellectual capital. Are there businesses where you could go out and buy a fix and flip business for $70 million? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I mean, you can definitely see some things. Um, Sikkim Capital is an example, right? Um, they're public. Uh, you know, they're, they're on the S A C H is the ticker for those of people who are kind of playing along. Yeah. And their market cap right now is 142 and a half million. And let's pull up their balance sheet real quick. I mean, they're doing over $13 million a year in revenue. Um, they're trailing 12 months is almost 14, it looks like. And they've got total assets as of the end of last year of $226 million. Mm -hmm. um, it's been a while since I've looked at them. Um, I'm pretty sure they've done some more debt offerings since then. So that, that number may be going up. I mean, you can really scale those businesses pretty quickly if you know what you're doing. And Sankum is actually a very well-run business. If you're looking for some something to, to kind of teach you about the business, you should go check out their presentations. They're run by... Um, a, a guy who's a, he's an accountant. Um, he's really sharp and he's really motivated by kind of their, their interesting REIT structure for dividends. They is pay out the, a lot. Is that the one where him and his brother like had some weird law, lawsuit? I think you and I were talking about it and we were like, oh, there, there's going to be some issues at the Thanksgiving dinner table there. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm not totally certain what happened with that, but it seems like one of them wanted out and you know, there was some weird stuff that seems to be all taken care of. But I mean, right now that thing's yielding, I want to say just under 10%. Um, and, and you was know, that, was that used to be called, was that used to be called Manhattan Bridge? No, that's a separate one, actually. Oh, okay. They're smaller. Um, and, and the funny thing is SACOM actually has a much better debt stack than Manhattan Bridge did. Um, Manhattan Bridge, like the way their loans were written, because um, they were kind of doing these sweeps with banks and stuff. And like if the banks that were kind of lending them money didn't like the loans, they could just go into the, to uh, Manhattan's uh, accounts and just put it take back it. to them. Yeah. The SACOM actually has baby bonds that they issued. And that was one of the things, cool. that's how I found out about them is one of my buddies, um, when we thought COVID was going to kill all of us and we were sanitizing our Amazon packages, we were looking at those baby bonds and like I was buying them for like, I think 12 or $13 and they had a 25 face. So like yep. my yep. yield to maturity on that was like 30% or something stupid. And I, then, I remember you sent that to me and I was like, Hey Jeff, that, that looks pretty interesting, but these guys, they've got a bunch of short term loans and they're buying houses. And this is like peak eight, early April, 2020. And I was like, everything's down 50%. They're, they're bankrupt. Their parts of market is bankrupt, but they, you know, things worked out. Um, but, but, but AMC, like if you look at the, the, the market cap of Manhattan Bridge Capital, they could actually buy Manhattan Bridge Capital right now. I mean, Manhattan, well, I don't think the guy would sell it for this, but uh, the, the market cap is, call it $74 million, right? So that's 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 compelling. And it's got a, a just under 8% yield. So that's compelling, even from where we own the stock, I think. Jeff, we mentioned 
fix and flip as a possibility. We mentioned crypto as a possibility for them to uh, to buy. Is there anything else? I, I think they published one other thing in their 10Q, but is there anything else just based on your understanding of the company? I know you guys have talked to other, I'm insulted you talked to other people than me about this, but other people you've talked about your diligence around Irby. Is there anything else you think they could go with that they, they would buy that, hey, you'd be excited about, the market might get excited about, or just something you think they're likely to acquire? No, Jeff is giving me a shrugs emoji. Thomas, what about you? Anything else worthwhile talking about? I, as a I, th- I, think, I think anything in financial services, Bill Irby is going to feel comfortable with. I think- and I say, I say he's going to feel comfortable with. The board's going to, you know, at the end of the day, like, I'm sure it's going to be, there's bad. Oops. It's deal, like, oh, did I freeze on you? You, you cut out for one second. Go ahead. I think anything in financial services that we're comfortable with. And just on the fix and flip, like you also forget that they're like other people than the, the equity holder. Like if a bank owns a, a property and they're in the money for 145 million, they're selling it, or excuse me, 145,000, they're, they're selling it for 160. Who the hell do they care? Or what do they care? They don't care that it's a guy buying it. They just want their money today. Yep. Like what do they, what do they care? The equity holder is going to get short change 10,000 bucks or 20,000 bucks. No, I I hear you. I guess my worry, you know, my original worry with fix and flip, it's just, it's very, very intellectually capital intensive and kind of relationship driven. It's the person who's doing the fix and flip where the asset is. And I just always worry about those because it also seems like very much a cost of capital cash driven business where there's not a lot differentiating your your hustle. No, I would agree. uh, I think there's some guys have come up ways with making marketplaces or to lower their cost of capital, meaning they like they have the baby bonds or they have a marketplace, you know, where they're going to like resell it. But I think for the most part, like it's a yield business, like, you know, just like a bank or something. Sticking with you, Thomas, one thing, I mean, I've, I've written it off at zero. I think most of us wrote it off at zero, but it could get real substantial is Irby is bringing a lawsuit. I think it's against BlackRock. And the way yeah. I understand and Pimco. It, and Pimco. The way I understand it, you know, he's seeking billions. I think AAMC would split. Irby is bringing the lawsuit and I believe he's paying for it, but I think AAMC would split the proceeds. But I, I can't see I'm super up to date on it. I, I kind of ascribed it zero, but it's it could be substantial. So could you give us a little background there and how that would play out? How big it could be to AAMC if we got lucky and we won or something? I mean, do you want me to give my real honest opinion? <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, why not? Yeah, it's but Thomas, I'll, but I'll try to, Thomas is in Italy to and he's having some drinks with this podcast, so he can he can get real honest yeah. with us. Okay, so they bought it in, I think they bought it, they bring it in Virginia or they bring it in St. Croix? I think they brought it in St. Croix. I heard the reason they brought it down there is because they wanted a judge to give them a judgment. They were like hoping for a kangaroo court judgment, uh, whatever, you know, you can say what you will of that. Uh I think the hardest part, you know, in, in, in all, in, in, you know, just to be real is, you know, who, who's the offended party and like, you know, okay, so every tort has two parts. Like when you bring a lawsuit, it's a tort, right? So what's the tort? The tort is, you know, was there liability and what were the damages? Okay, what's their liability? Okay, maybe they'll find tons of smoking guns and there is liability. But the question is like, how was AAMC actually damaged by this? Can I mean, you maybe up? you could say can Sorry. you back up, Thomas? Because we talked about how are they damaged and who's the offended party, but we haven't said what the lawsuit is for yet. Oh, I mean, I, I, again, I'm, I'm, it's been a while since I've actually looked at the lawsuit, but my, my, when I re- if I remember the lawsuit correctly, it's basically for selling them mortgages and I assume mortgage service rights to go along with that that were, you know, bad. That were, there was no due diligence done and uh, um you know, uh, fraudulent, you know, these loans were basically fraudulent loans. Um, I, I think the tough part for a servicer is going to be, uh, you know, isn't the, isn't the investor really the offended party, you know, uh, not, not the service company. Um, yeah, but maybe they can make the argument that they're the part of the daisy chain and that, you know, they lost all of the, the income from from the rights and and from the servicing because these were all fraudulent loans, which they had in good faith hired people and set up businesses to that they could have profited from if these weren't fraudulent uh, mortgages. I definitely think it's it's got some sizzle. I wouldn't pay a lot for it um, or anything for it, but uh, 
it's possible you could get a judgment for a few hundred million bucks. I mean, it's, it's really not out of the cards. Again, I wouldn't pay anything for it. You never, you know what these things, you know, there's a, there's a famous thing that you'll, you'll hear if you have a lot of lawyers as friends, they'll say things like, that's a fact intensive question. And what they're really meaning is nobody really knows until you start seeing the email ch chains and you start seeing like the depositions and what people knew and when they knew it and how they knew it and what they really, you know. So these are very fact intensive questions. And, um, you know, you can be surprised and the face value of the surprised. lawsuit, I, I believe the the lawsuit, the they're seeking, seeking 10 figures in damages, right? So if AAMC splits half of that and, you know, even if they settle for pennies on the dollar of 10 figures, there's 2 million shares outstanding. If AMC gets half of it, let's say it's a hundred million settlement. AMC gets half of it. Cool. We're talking more than it's $20 per share in cash. So super long shot. I would not advise anyone to bet on this coming out, but it's always nice to have a long shot or two in your net cash shell that you're buying, right? With, with tax assets that would cover a lot of those proceeds if they got them. Uh, oh Jeff, yeah. What are their tax? What's their tax asset position? Do you know? I believe it's, they have NOLs. I can't remember off the top of my head how much. And I also believe they have tax advantages because they are a Virgin Islands company. So I think they, right. they pay a lot less there too, which is also, you know, crypto could have some pretty bad tax ramifications. Fix and flip is a cash heavy business, mm. short-term gain. So I do think the, the tax assets could get uh, pretty interesting there. But off the top of my head, I can't remember the exact position. Jeff, did you want to add anything on either their tax position or the lawsuit that we're talking about? Uh, it looks like they've got 285 and wow, federal and OLs. Maybe I don't know. I don't know how many zeros are on this uh balance, uh, that they're not reporting. It says 285 someplace, though. So, you know, there you go. Not buying it for the NOLs, but you know, that's thrown for free. For free. So, something last, last question I want to do, and then I'll turn it over to you guys for closing thoughts. You know, the, the tons of risks here. Everyone should remember, not investing advice. We're talking about a net shell. If the preferreds have teeth, it's a zero. You know, obviously, Irby has some hair on him. You, you've got risk there. Acquisitions are risky, so everybody should remember that. But the one thing I look at is the cash burn, right? This is a cash shell. And if your cash burn is zero, that's great. You're buying under cash, and the cash is always there. Cash burn here is actually pretty high. A lot of that, I think, is related to the preferred lawsuits and all that, which, again, that's why I'm a little bit worried about the the lawsuits dragging on, but can you guys just talk to me about how you look at the cash and the cash burn and everything here? Well, look at the incentives, right? I mean, for, for, if they're in a lawsuit with the preferred shareholders, they're kind of wanting to make the company look worse than it is. So, you know, that's kind of the point. I think that it'll probably slow down. Yeah, that's a good point. Thomas, anything else to add there? I mean, yeah. I just actually hurt, hurt, hurt our investment thesis by saying that because we just kind of telegraphed part of that to like the, uh, the attorneys for uh, Luxor. I don't know. Oh, no, come on. Yeah, I, I, I am with you. But it, look, everybody, it, it would be tough for them to come and be like, these three guys on the podcast said this is what you're trying to do because <laughs> every company tries to do that. You know, my, my worry here is I think in Q2, they burned about $2 million of cash, if I'm remembering correctly, 2 million shares outstanding. So that's a dollar per share in cash. You do that a couple quarters in a row, that adds up real quickly from, you know, we're buying under 30 and they've got a little bit over 30 in cash. So, uh, Thomas, anything to add on the cash burn? Last thing here, and I'm going to, you know, tip my cap to myself here. I think one thing that was underreported here is they hired two new executives in the past three months. And these are these are real guys, right? They hired a, a new CFO who, if I remember correctly, was the controller at Diamond Resorts, which was a... 4 billion timeshare company that just did a huge deal sold to HGV, Hilton Grand Vacations. Uh, so he's a real guy. He just came off a successful sale. And then they hired a new, I think it's legal counsel, who was a, mm -hmm. a high up lawyer at Goldman, right? So it's not like, as I've said, it's not like they hired Jeff Bezos and Steve Jobs, but they hired real people. And I was kind of looking at it as this is a $55 million market cap company, cash shell that would be worth zero if the preferreds are here. Like the fact that they could hire real executives speaks to A, the executives probably got comfortable that this isn't going to file for bankruptcy or be worthless because of the press in the next six months or something. And B, they're not j hiring, but I don't think they join because they want to join a cash shell. I think they join mm -hmm. because they talked to Irby and Irby says, hey, here's the acquisitions we're working on. We're going to build something really sexy. You're getting on the ground floor of a rocket ship. I mean, I, I'm 
pitching my own thesis a little bit and pitching a little bit of speculation, but do you guys see that differently? Do y'all agree? Do y'all want to just agree with me outright? Like, how, how are you thinking? Agree. About that? <laughs> I think that's very well put, Andrew. Yeah. Well, that, that's what I like to hear. Let, let's. <laughs> we, we really... In unison. Kumbaya, my stock. Kumbaya. <laughs> We've been running for about an hour. It's a super interesting thesis, it's a, but it's cash shell, right? So you can speculate, but they're beyond talking the preferreds, talking the incentives and everything, which I think we hit on them all. There's not a ton to talk about, but Jeff, I'll start with you. Is there anything you think we should have hit harder? Anything we didn't hit that you're, you're kind of wanting to get off before we wrap this up? Nope. Perfect. Thomas, what about you? Anything else we should have hit? Anything we shouldn't hit? No, buy it over time, guys. Like, there's not a deal like right now. Like, just just if you, if you're interested in the story, do your due diligence and like take your time. Like, this isn't going anywhere. That's that's great. So, just before we wrap up, I'll remind all listeners: micro cap, pretty liquid, quite risky. So, not investing advice. If you if you decide this fits your risk profile, you've got to use limit orders on e-liquid micro caps. So just remember both that, but nothing on here was investing advice. Uh, Jeff, it was great to have you on for a repeat podcast. Thomas, you did my podcast maybe two or three weeks ago. I've got to listen to the Bill Brewster podcast that just dropped. And then you did this podcast today. I mean, you are just a podcast machine right now, but guys, it was great talking to both of you. I love this thesis. Again, I saw it, dropped everything, researched it in six hours. It got a little bit of a position. So I, I appreciate you guys coming on and sharing this with us. And uh, yeah, if you guys are ready, we'll wrap it up there. Yeah. Thanks very much, Andrew. Looking forward Thanks, to having Andrew. you guys on for the next one. Talk to you all soon.